My name is Denise Cole and with the Oklahoma Perinatal Quality Improvement Collaborative and we are happy to host today a webinar um, regarding newborn screening and some of the recent um, updates that have happened with the Oklahoma Newborn Screening Program. And uh, OPQIC has been partnering with the Newborn Screening uh, Department at the Oklahoma State Department of Health in their Every Baby Counts Quality Improvement Initiative. Um, trying to make sure that every baby um, has the opportunity to have a screen for potentially life-threatening metabolic conditions um, very early in their life. So I'd like to introduce um, the ladies from the Oklahoma State Department of Health who are going to be presenting the content of the webinar today. We have Jennifer Basinger, the Newborn Screening Program Manager, Caitlin Moran, um, who is their Quality Assurance and Education Coordinator, and Tanya McAllister, their lab supervisor. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Hi, everybody. We really appreciate um, you taking the time out of your busy days to join the call today. So um, we just wanted to provide some updates and um, some discussion and really uh, have a chance for you guys to have access to us to ask questions. So I do have some slides that I'm going to go through. Um, but then really at the end we hope to have at least um, 15 minutes or so for you guys to ask us questions, whatever is going on um, in your world that we can help you with. So there again is a slide with, with our name so you can actually see who is on the call. And then this is a slide that I had up while you guys were um, calling in and, and getting ready for us to start because this is really important. So as Denise said, we have partnered with OPIC to help provide this training and they actually have this great online training for you all to utilize um, as a resource as you're doing your annual trainings, you have questions, new nurses are coming on board that are, are starting to screen babies. Um, we really want people to utilize this training site. Um, so here's the quick link and I'll actually show it to you um, later. First off, everybody knows that we um, rolled out a brand new filter paper in August. Um, so everybody should be using that now. And we just wanted to give a couple reminders. There's a couple of things that we've been seeing come in um, that actually have been impacting us a little bit. So the first one is make sure that you're um, entering your submitter ID prior to sending that screen to us. We have to have that number or the facility's information on there for us to process the screen. It, did, it used to be on the left-hand corner of the filter paper. It's now on the right-hand corner, and so I don't know if that's kind of the movement of the positioning of that has thrown people off, but um, make sure that that's getting done, please, before they're sent in. The other one is the ordering physician. The ordering physician must be filled in. Um, we have to have the ordering physician to process the screen. If you're at a teaching facility, the attending physician should be the ordering physician. We should never use a resident or a student as the ordering physician. Follow-up physician is not required to run the screen. However, it is required if we're to do follow-up, if the screen's abnormal and we need to do follow-up. So um, do your best to make sure that that information is filled in as well. Um, and then baby's name. There have been a lot of questions around this because I think we've kind of shifted. And you guys are used to putting in mom's last name and baby's first name or male or female. But what we're finding is that it's really a, a lot easier for us if we have baby's name that will, as it will appear on the birth certificate. So if you know baby's legal name when you're filling out the form, please enter that information on there before you send it in. If you don't, we don't want you to delay sending the screen. You can put, still use Baby Boy Hall or Baby Girl Smith. Um, it's just easier for us if there's an abnormal screen with some of the larger providers we have in the state if we have baby's legal name. Otherwise, we're doing a lot of digging to find baby's legal name and it's delaying care um, a little bit. So if possible, please utilize the name that will be on the birth certificate. 
So I want to kind of start with a story. I don't know if I have, uh, if you are one of the facilities I've visited in the last few months, you've probably heard me say this, but newborn screening is a system. So it's not just my follow-up team. It's not just the lab. It's a system, and that system includes you all at the birthing facility, the midwives collecting the screens, and the system starts when we collect that screen. So from the time we've collected that screen, all the pieces that it takes to get that screen tested, results reported out, and that screen is either normal or the baby is diagnosed with a condition. That's when the system ends. For us, it's picked up with long-term follow-up and the, and the specialist, obviously, when we have a diagnosed baby. But if the entire system doesn't work together and all the pieces function appropriately, that's when we run into problems it's really important for that system, for all of us to, to do each piece correctly and in the time frame that, that's recommended to impact that baby's life in a positive way and save baby's lives. And so, um, and that's, that's why we're all here. We all have that common goal of the baby. And so I wanna share a story with you so that you can understand the importance of the whole system working together. So if you have an you know, if we have an unsatisfactory for testing or a delay in courier pickup or a delay in getting it to the lab for the courier to pick up, um, a delay in collection, a delay in our public health lab for testing or a delay in us calling out abnormal results. Those are the, the system pieces that I'm talking about. So we had a baby born at a, a rural Oklahoma um, hospital this summer actually a hospital that we tend to get all, quite a few unsatisfactory for testing specimens from. So we got the screen in. They collected the screen 24 hours and one minute, just like they're supposed to. The courier picked it up, got it to our public health lab, just the way it was supposed to. Our public health lab run, ran the screen, and they could see off the initial run that this baby's citrulline was very, very, very high. And citrulline is a very time-critical disorder. Um, and so what they did was while they were waiting for the final test result, they called us in follow-up. And so we immediately reached out to start trying to find this baby. And we found the baby had been admitted back to that hospital and was in serious condition. And they were starting to test for sepsis and some other things that you would expect in a sick baby, not a newborn metabolic disorder, um, because they're rare, right? So they're testing for sepsis and some other things. And when we called, we were like, check the ammonia, because if baby citrulline's elevated, we don't have a final result. We'll have it for you later this afternoon or first thing in the morning, but check that baby's ammonia. Baby's ammonia was very high. I don't remember the exact value, 600 to 700. They had to metaflight baby to a higher level of care facility that started some ammonia eaters. By the time the baby got to that higher level of care facility, baby was already seizing. Had we not had every piece of that system work and we waited till the next day to notify them of that result or that baby's screen was unsatisfactory for testing, that baby would not have survived. That baby ended up actually being transferred to Baylor because it needed, um, dialysis, neonatal dialysis, um, and has been diagnosed since with citrullinemia. It's getting the care it needs and is going to, and is going to survive because every piece of that newborn s screening system worked appropriately for that baby. Had Again, had one piece fallen, that baby probably wouldn't be alive or have severe neurological damage related to the seizures as they were trying to figure it out. So all that to be said is because I don't think that a lot of times in, in the hospital settings, you guys don't hear those stories. So not everything is as time critical as citrulline, and we know that, but every disorder we screen for can impact this baby's life by us identifying it early. So that being said, think about this, filling out the form even if it delays, if we don't have the appropriate information and we have to call and then wait for you to call back because you couldn't find the information or those things, even that can delay results because we can't run that specimen without all that information. So every piece of this is really important.
Um, so today we're going to mostly uh, spend the next few minutes talking about transit time. Um, and I'm going to show you some state numbers later, but transit time is something that we really struggle um, in the state to state with, and so it's something that we've really been trying to figure out how to focus on and how to get the message out there that it's really important um, that we're getting the specimens to public health lab in a timely manner. And so transit time is uh, the time between the collection of a newborn screening specimen and its receipt here in Oklahoma City at the um, public health laboratory. Specimens should be received within our lab within 48 hours from the time of collection. And this is mandated by Oklahoma statute, and so I've got those sections up here. But what we know is delays in receiving the specimen equal delays in testing the specimen, which equal delays in diagnosis and treatment. So we do, um, Oklahoma is one of the few states that actually provides a courier system to its birthing facilities for pickup of those newborn screens and transport to our public health lab. And so every facility has seven day a week or five day a week courier service provided um, through our contract. Our agency has a contract with the courier service to provide those to you. So um, one of the things that we know for improving transit time is making sure that everybody in your facility that's involved in the newborn screening collection or handling a newborn screen knows about your courier pickup time, the location that the courier picks up, and really understands the importance of getting those screens to that location for timely pickup. Do not batch the specimens. So we don't want, you, if you only have one dried, we want you to send that one. Don't wait for the next five that aren't dry yet to send six together. We don't care if it's just one. Don't batch those specimens. Get those to us as soon as possible. The other big piece there is to ensure that the newborn screen is collected at 24 hours and one minute of age, and then again goes out with the courier as soon as possible after it's dried. We know it has to dry for about three to four hours. Set timeliness goals that are specific. Set, I think that set timeliness and goals. I think that should say set timeliness goals specific for your facility. So we do have some overall state goals that we're reaching. But if your facility is really struggling with meeting some of these numbers, we would suggest um, looking at your processes and identifying goals that are achievable for your facility because every small improvement will impact our overall number. The other thing is because we have a third party involved, so we have the courier involved who's a part of this system, um, maintain a courier transport log. That way if there is a problem, we can help identify whether it's a, a problem within your facility of getting those ready for courier pickup, or if it's actually a delay in the courier um, from the time they've picked it up to the time that they drop it off at our public health lab, and then we can address that appropriately. Um, so that really helps us kind of figure out where, where the problem lies. And then review your transit time reports. Um, we do provide monthly reports to every hospital. We have a list of contacts and we send those out. Um, they run a month behind, so um, you know, you got July's reports in August, but we send those securely every month to some hospital contacts. We also have them all available on the website, and I'm going to review a little bit more of that here in a minute. So look at those and see exactly how your facility is doing. And then if there is an issue, the courier is not um, come, I think we say a two-hour grace window, Tonya, is that correct? Do you want to mute, Tonya? Okay. So I think I was going to verify with Tonya because the, the lab uh, does the courier service, but I think it's two hours. So they give you a window of we're supposed to pick up between eight and nine daily, and by 11 o'clock they're not there call us at the public health lab so that we can check in to see what's going on. Maybe they've had car trouble or there's another issue, but that way we can help um, identify that and address it. Sorry, yes, I was on mute. <laughs> and I was one-handed because I had surgery yesterday, so I'm a little slow. So um, yes, it's a, it's a two-hour window. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I was right because I was trying to remember if it was one or two hours. So. Um, here are some slides that you can actually use to find these online reports, but I'm actually going to walk you through it. There's a couple of places here. So 
we, put, we publish our transit time and our unsatisfactory for testing reports so that they're available to the public and facilities can go in there and see how they compare to like-size hospitals. Um, we also mail those reports along with some specific hospital reporting that's a little that's not available online and some other information. We send those securely monthly to the contacts that we have. So if you're not one of those people receiving an email, I would recommend that you check in with your manager and find out who's getting those and ask to see them if they're not being shared with you. They are sent securely because sometimes they contain patient information. And so those secure emails are only available for two weeks. So we recommend that the um, whoever's getting them at the facility save, download those and save, um, save them to a spot on their computer so that they're accessible going forward. Or if you have a, a shared location that they can be saved so other people can access them, we recommend that as well. But let's say um, you've changed positions or you don't have access to those and, or you want to see how other hospitals are doing too. They are available on our website. So if you go up here to www.ok.gov forward slash health, there's a couple ways to do this and I'm going to show you. Prevention and preparedness, if you click on that, that brings you over here to our public health laboratory um, section and we can click on that again. And here you'll see this Every Baby Counts QI program. So one more time, if we click, you'll see here's our Every Baby Counts QI program and some information for you. Um, there's rules and regulations. There's a, this um, information on how to fill out the form. Here's your link to your provider IDs, that ordering provider. If you don't know their provider ID, these are all of our Oklahoma newborn screening provider update IDs updated as of July 2019. There's also a courier service map, so you can see exactly where our courier is going. But to back to transit time, here's our transit time report and our unsatisfactory for specimen, unsatisfactory specimen reports. So if you click on transit time, if it's going to work, this is it. So you can see we have transit time reports and unsatisfactory reports by year and by month. We are running a couple of months behind. We're getting caught up, though. Um, the person that did our reporting was out unexpectedly for most of the month of September, and so she actually, we just got August, so we haven't had a chance to get those actually sent out to the facilities and, and updated on the website. But you could click on July and you could open that report. And you could actually see if you are Integris Miami where you fall compared to your peers. So this is for those hospitals with five-day courier service. And then we have those hospitals with seven-day courier service. So you can actually see how well your facility is doing compared to others. That being said, we have partnered with OPIC and they also have an Every Baby Counts Newborn Screening website. So it is opic.org forward slash newborn screening. If you scroll down here, they have some information on our statute as well. Um, there are the resources. So here's that online edu education from that first slide. Um, you do have to have a password. You can email them and we'll send it to you. This link takes you right back to the Every Baby Counts website. Or you can actually do uh, go straight to the hospital uh, transit time. <laughs> transit time reports or the unsatisfactory reports, our provider ID numbers, um, and they're also, this webinar will be posted uh, afterwards because it is being recorded. So you will, you will see there's a couple of different ways to get to those. That's these slides, so I can move on here. So how are we doing? I thought it would be really um, interesting for you all to see the numbers of the state as a whole. So how is Oklahoma doing with some of these things? for newborn screening. So this is actually our transit time report. You can see that our goal is to have 95% of those specimens to the public health lab within 48 hours of collection. And remember, it's state mandated that they're here within 48 hours of collection, but we know sometimes there are issues. So our goal is 95%. We haven't met it yet. That's why we're focusing on that. We did go up a little bit in August again, and we're hoping to see some more increases in September because we have been working really hard on this. Um, and trying to find identify identify ways that we can help um, ensure that that they're getting here and, and working with hospitals. 
then we have our percentage of unsatisfactory specimens for the state. So our goal is less than 2% of our specimens will be unsatisfactory for testing. And again, we're getting close to the 2%, but we haven't hit this yet. So that's again where you can go back to those unsatisfactory for testing reports and identify um, identify where your facility is at and set goals um, for your facility. Because these are, again, these are babies' lives. So these are babies that have not yet had a screen. We don't know if it's normal or abnormal because we haven't been able to test their screen. That to me is the scary part. Um, missing information. So we get a filter paper form that's not filled out completely and there's pieces missing that we need to run the screen or to be able to interpret test results. Um, those are the calls we call you. You've heard from Caitlin probably, um, myself, Janet. We will call you to get those pieces of information so that our public health lab can run that screen. Um, and so you can see kind of where our missing information. Our goal would be to have less than 1% of the specimens, the form sent in with missing identifiers that are required to run the screen. Um, we expected this in August with the change of the filter paper, this big 2.9 increase, we knew it was going to go up. Um, I actually am really happy it wasn't higher than that. I hope when we see September's numbers that we've seen it start to taper back down. So these are um, the percentage of initial, so not repeat screens, but initial newborn screens that are collected within uh, with less than 48 hours after birth. We know timeliness, we want 24 hours and one minute, um, but these are would include less than 24 hour screens. And we do really well as a state on this. You guys do a great job of getting those newborn screens collected immediately and sent, sent in. And so our goal is 95% and we, have, we maintain well above that. So we do really, really well at this piece. And that is a credit to all of you that are out there collecting the screens in that timely manner. This is a slightly different, so we're narrowing it down. This is the percent of screens that are actually initial screens that are collected at 24 hour and one minute to 48 hours, which we know is the ideal collection time. Again, we want it as close to that 24 hours and one minute as possible. Um, and we do pretty well at this too. So if you can see our last um, few months, we've been well over the 95%. And so this is again, you guys are collecting those screens at the right time and you're doing a really good job of sustaining that for us. So, you know, you guys have to fill out the form, you have to get it to the courier, you have to collect it on time. Well, we have a responsibility too and we have a responsibility to report those results out in a timely manner. So this shows you the, and all of the initial results that we received that were reported within, 70 day, within seven days of life. From the time of birth to the time of report out, we are within a week. We are getting 98% of those reported out within a week, and that is amazing. Our goal is greater than 95%. So this is, again, the system and how we all work together. And lastly, just a little bit of exciting news. Um, we wanted to share some updates with you. So we um, went through the legislative process this spring to um, get approval to add four new conditions to our newborn screening panel. Um, so we will be meeting the national recommendations. We will meet the um, recommended uniform screening panel as it's put out there by, a by the national committee. So September 13th, 2019, we actually had new rules go into effect that will add four conditions to our current newborn screening panel. Um, these conditions will be added slowly over the next year um, and include Pompeii, mucopolysaccharidosis type 1, spinal muscular atrophy, and X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. And I did put those on there in the order in which we will be expanding. First, you're going to see Pompeii and MPS1. Uh, we will begin screening for those hopefully our projected date is mid-December, maybe a little sooner, maybe a little later, but before the end of the year is our hope. 
Um, and so you will, those will start to be reported out this year, which is amazing. SMA will come uh, late spring, probably next year, and then XALD end of summer. We're guessing there, there's still some, a lot of work to be done, so those timelines may be pushed out a little bit. But we are actually in the process of um, starting validation for these for Pompeii and MPS1 in our lab. So those will be coming um, soon. So I thought I would just take a couple of minutes to kind of explain what MPS1 and Pompeii are for you so that you have a little bit of understanding of what we're, we're doing. Um, MPS1 is a progressive multi-system disorder. It impacts multiple organs, multiple body parts. It is autosomal recessive, and it involves a mutation in the IDUA gene. Um, basically, it results in improper functioning of lysosomal enzymes, which causes an accumulation of a complex carbohydrate. In this instance, it's called glycosaminoglycans. We call it GAGs. Um, the incidence for this is about 1 in 1,000 live births for the severe form or 1 in 500,000 live births for the attenuated form. So you can see it's very rare. Um, so it leads to cellular dysfunction, particularly in the bones, joints, brain, spinal cord, heart, spleen, and liver. Signs and symptoms, and again, these may or may not be apparent at birth, um, include macrocephaly, heart valve, heart valve abnormalities, umbilical or inguinal hernia, coarse facial features, and hearing loss. Treatment for the severe form is a stem cell transplant. Um, the, the less severe form and the severe form all, both can get enzyme replacement therapy, and this is a weekly infusion. Um, with enzyme replacement therapy, if we can start it before symptoms occur, we can hopefully slow or slow symptom onset or prevent symptom onset. If symptoms have already started, we we may or we probably won't gain anything back. Um, and then supportive therapies, PT, surgeries, if we've got hydrocephalus, those can for hearing if there's a hearing disorder, those things. Um, and for Pompeii. So again, these are both lysosomal storage diseases, so they kind of work in a similar fashion. So it's a disorder of progressive muscle weakness. It is autosomal recessive, again, but this one is a mutation in the GAA gene. It is, again, a deficiency or improper functioning of, ly of a lysosomal enzyme that causes an accumulation of glycogen. It occurs in 1 in 40,000 people in the U.S., so we can expect 1 in 40,000 live births. So we could see potentially one of these a year. It leads to cellular dysfunction, particularly in cardiac, smooth, and skeletal muscles. It usually begins within a few months of birth, so symptoms may or may not be present at birth. They include hypotonia, hepatomegaly, severe cardiomegaly, Myopathy, feeding difficulties, and progressive respiratory insufficiency. The treatment is enzyme replacement therapy every two weeks. Um, this is, again, if we wait till they're symptomatic to start treatment, we're probably not going to correct those symptoms. But if we can get it prior to, um, which is the goal of newborn screening, then we can hopefully delay or stop the progression. And again, supportive therapies, they're going to need PT, OT, different things. So that being said, here is our contact information. I'm going to wrap up real quick so we can get to questions. Um, here's our contact information. If you have questions that you want to reach out to us, not just about today's webinar, but anytime. We really like questions. We love to talk to you all. We love to help. Um, and so. It could be something that's going on in the unit um, at a specific time, and before you make a decision, you want to call us to get our feedback. We're happy to do that. Um, so there's that, and then I'm going to open it for questions. But before I do that, um, OPIC sent out an email requesting questions to be emailed to them um, just to kind of help facilitate. And so we did get a couple of really good questions that we want to review with you first, and then we'll see um, what questions 
everybody else has. I'm going to let Caitlin review those questions with you and provide our feedback on them. Real quick, Caitlin, this is Denise. I'm just going to suggest that if you do have questions, um, go ahead and put them into the chat box. That way we can kind of get that list started. Okay, so again, my name is Caitlin, and I am now transitioning into the QA and education role. Previously, I was just the follow-up nurse coordinator. We received a couple questions prior to the start of the webinar. The first one was with the collection method, asking about using a clean two-by-two two to wipe away the first blood drop, but um, they don't use sterile two-by-twos, and so we follow the CLSI guidelines, and so there is one specifically for blood collection for a filter paper for a newborn screen, and they recommend to wipe away the first drop of blood with a sterile gauze pad, and that is to eliminate the risk of dilution of the blood drop by either tissue fluids or any residual alcohol. So we do recommend to use that, and if you can use that sterile gauze pad just so that you're not introducing anything onto those, that baby's heel. And then our next question was talking about after collection and transporting the specimen to the lab. And this particular facility um, will send the filter paper to the lab in a plastic biohazard bag. And then the lab will then remove it immediately and dry it in the lab. And they have started that process because they were leaving specimens in the nursery or wherever they were collected to dry, and then they weren't getting picked up as timely to get transported. And again, we refer back to the CLSI guidelines, and the recommendation is to dry completely before transporting if you can. And that is to dry horizontally on a non-absorbent open surface for three hours, and that you leave that cover flap off of the blood spots until they are completely dry and that specimens should not be stacked or allowed to touch other surfaces during their drying period, and that it's not recommended for those specimens to be placed into a sealed airtight container such as a plastic bag, even after drying. And so our recommendations would be, if you can avoid it, please do not place into that plastic bag and send to the lab. If it is something that is a very small time frame and it has not affected the specimens, if you can track it to see if you've had any unsatisfactory specimens since switching to that method, then you know you may be able to do that for that temporary, but we really do not recommend to place into the plastic bag for transport. Those are your if, so if you were that facility, what I would want to look at is my unsatisfactory for specimens, and am I getting specimens with serum seepage? Um, that's the those rings. Those are that's the biggest impact to that. Um, I think. Would you have anything to add, Tanya? No, Caitlin's answer was uh, very thorough, and and we're in agreement in the lab with that as well. Okay. Can you repeat that? I'm so sorry. We didn't hear you. What were you wanting Tanya to repeat? Yes. So she just said that, no, she agrees that that's the um, recommendation that the lab would provide as well. That they would, that they would, no plastic bags at all? That's, yeah, Correct. so we have to follow the CLSI recommendations. So what we recommend to you is what CLSI says. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. So those are the questions that were provided to us prior to the webinar. At this point, we have about 25 minutes still left, and I would love to be able to open this up for others who have questions. Have we? Do we have any questions in the chat, Denise? I can't see it. I don't know where to go. We do not have any questions in the chat, but I. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone on our end. And okay. so if you're not speaking, if you'll please mute yourself on your own end, um, that way we get less feedback. Okay. Everybody should be unmuted at this point. Okay. And questions do not have to be related to today's um, transit time or anything like that. So if you have questions about today's topic, great. But if you just have other questions um, from your own experience or your own facility processes, we're happy to answer those as well. Anything you want to discuss, anything like that. 
Anya. So if I understood, yeah, so if I understood your question correctly, the weekend courier is coming earlier and earlier, so it's difficult to have questions ready. Is that what you Correct. stated? That's okay. What tell me. Um, so are they coming before 8 a.m.? No, but they were coming later in the day, so they kind of had their schedule, you know, that they have been show, getting here about 9 o'clock or something. So, yeah, the courier, I know that the courier schedules can sometimes change, and the weekend is much more fluid, but it should still be within a fairly narrow window. If you will email me the times that they've been coming, then I will pass that information on to Steve Johnson, our lab administrative director. He works directly with the courier. And we'll see if we can figure out why you're getting such a time discrepancies and see if there's something we can do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Vicki. Anybody else have any questions for us? Okay. Um, I guess my only question is that when we get back unsatisfactory, we can't always, because there's multiple options that it could be, it's hard to know what the real issue was, do you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. I think the actual yeah. specimen and it just has like the blanket, here's what it could be, but we look at it and it's like, well, it looks pretty good to me, but <laughs> not sure, like, I don't, is there any way that we can get it to be a little more specific? Um, we're doing everything we can to try and make sure that we're not getting them sent back and we still get them sent back even when we look at them before we send them out thinking they look good. So that's a great question. This is Tanya. So if there's ever one that you want more detailed information on for sure, feel free to call me and I will actually pick up the specimen as long as it has been greater than 42 days because they're all destroyed at that period. But I will go take the specimen and look at it and then I will call you and we can look at the scanned image together. Um, so that can sometimes be helpful. Um, in terms of blanket statements, so we have a lot of unsatisfactory codes already and so, you know, if we put more than one code, that means since there were five blood spots, that there were different things potentially wrong with them. Um, so you, with the five spots, you can have one that the circles were not completely filled or weren't thoroughly saturated, and then you could have others where they have multiple applications of blood drops. So, um, I know that for like the U52 code, it says multiple application of blood drops or super saturation. So what you would be looking for in that case is, are can you see more than one drop of blood within that preprinted area, or do the blood drops look like they overlap? So that would be multiple blood drops or multiple application, and the oversaturation would be a drop or two that's just, it's really enormously large. It, go, it, it expands beyond the preprinted circle. And so, unfortunately, we can't break them down any more than that because it would be really cumbersome to be able to keep up with the number of codes that we have in the system. But please feel free to call us anytime you have questions on them and I will walk you through them. Sometimes they don't show up quite as well when they're scanned. And so that we, we understand that as well. We did purchase a better scanner and it has helped, but um, anytime you have questions on those, don't hesitate to give me a call so we can walk through them. Okay, thank you, Tonya. I, I, I think that just, that helped a little more just explaining it that way, I thought. I thought the way it was listed, it was like, well, it could be any one of these things, but you're, we're not really sure which one it is. So the fact that it could be something on one dot and something on a different dot, I, I get that. So um, I appreciate your help on that. Absolutely, anytime. Tanya, this is Barbara O'Brien. Will you, um, I think it was really helpful when Denise and I toured the lab, how you explained why you need the five dots and, you know, why it's so important to have all of those completely filled. And can you kind of 
give a brief overview of the process in the lab and why it's so important to have all of the dots um, completed um, accurately? Sure. So we currently screen for 54 different conditions, and all of those conditions are part of a panel. So we can't choose, <clears throat> excuse me, we can't choose which tests we're going to screen for and which ones we're not. So we have to have enough blood there that is accurately um, on the filter paper to be able to screen for all those conditions. Right now that requires seven 3.2 millimeter hole punches, so sort of like your standard at-home hole punch, um, and then one really small one for one of the other tests. And that's just to do the initial screen, as I looks like Jennifer's about to pull up. <laughs> um, so that's just to do the that's just to do the initial screen. If any of the tests flag as out of range, then we will take two additional punches, run those in duplicate, and take an average of all three of the values that we get, and that will be how we will report out the result on that. Obviously, if you have a sick baby or a baby that's on any type of supplementation, um, MCT oil or TPN, those babies tend to flag abnormal on their screen for those reasons, and so those also get repunched. If the baby flags abnormal for our CAH screen, then we take two complete blood spot circles and cut them off and send them away for additional steroid profile testing. So that's two full circles that are gone just for that one test. So we never know what the baby is going to flag for, what kind of conditions they may have. So it really can take potentially all five of those blood spot circles to complete all of the testing and get accurate results out for the baby. So that's why we require the five circles. And as Jennifer had mentioned, we're going to be expanding to four new conditions. Some of those will multiplex with other tests, but Pompe and MPS1 will require their own blood spot. So that will be an additional punch that we'll have to take for those. So as we expand, um, we've had the five dry blood spot circles for a long time, and as we've expanded, we have never expanded the number of blood spot circles that we put on the filter paper. So we're getting, we're doing a lot with those. That's why we need all five. Thank you. And hopefully this slide shows, those are the seven, seven punches they have to take just to start the initial run of the test. With no, if there was nothing abnormal, that's all they would take out of it. But then if they were abnormals, then you could see how we would slowly run out of spots if they're not all good circles. We have a question in the chat that wants to just clarify, did we understand correctly that dried specimens should not be placed in a plastic bag? Yes, that's correct. The filter paper itself, when the specimen's collected to the time we get it, should never be in a plastic bag. Are there any other questions? So regarding that, how do we, is it a manila envelope or? What's acceptable for that from like a biohazard perspective? So the, once they're dry, the flap that's on the th filter paper goes back over the top of the drop, the blood spots, and then they're usually shipped and the courier usually picks them up in a manila envelope. Okay, and that's acceptable from a biohazard perspective? Yeah. Okay. Right. It, it is. Thank you. This is Denise again. I just wanted to um, mention, because in several of our previous meetings and in talking with hospitals who have very consistent low uh, rates of unsatisfactory unsat specimens, um, one strategy that seems to work well is to have a core group of staff at your facility that is, that's their job is to do the newborn metabolic screening collection. Um, so you kind of want your champions to be the ones who are drawing most of them. And it, depending on the size of your facility, that group may be, you know, a larger group, but making sure that you have those who are good at it, the ones doing it. Also having the ones who are good at it being the ones to teach 
um, in your facility, um, new oncoming staff on how to do the collection properly because, um, you know, as nurses, we're all aware that it is not an easy skill. It is certainly a skill that you have to um, practice and work on until you can acquire getting that perfect drop to put on the paper. So uh, assigning a core group to be doing that is, seems to work well for some facilities. Yeah, we have heard that over and over again, and the, the champions being the trainers. So if that's not always possible to just have the same people collect over and over again in your facility, but if you have those people that you know very rarely ever have an unsat, their specimens are always good quality, those are the people that should be training your new staff coming on to collect, and they should um, be watching your or retraining other staff and then watching them to make sure that once they feel like they're doing it, then they go do it on their own, but they don't do it on their own until those, those people have said, yep, they're doing it right, they're doing a good job. This is Barbara. Another strategy that we've heard, um, the Jennifer and Caitlin and Tanya mentioned the reports that are received, that are sent to the hospitals. Uh, I think one thing that could be helpful is to post those so that your staff can see your hospital reports and, you know, setting those goals. And yes, we, we improved and making this information public is a good strategy for the QI process so that the nurses who are the ones who are doing the collection and, and a big part of, as Jennifer talked about this system, that they are receiving feedback on how well your hospital is doing. So I think that's another good strategy to ensure that everyone's aware of where your hospital stands. And um, if you're working on improving, show those um, stats so they know whether you're improving. Or if you start going back down, make sure that um, those are shared as well so everybody knows your status. And we are always, um, you know, we, we do make visits and um, they're slow right now um, as we're building up staff here uh, to cover the daily work and, and expanding the disorders, but we are happy to schedule a visit. If you want us to come out um, and meet with a core group um, or something like that, or there's a topic that you feel like uh, you need education on, we are happy to work with you to try to schedule those visits. And it's it's not a coming out and pointing fingers or saying anything like that. It's really we're coming out as a part of the team um, to, to help you, to give you the information you need or to help you identify, look at what your current process is and say, okay, well, maybe if we just tweak this a little bit, maybe that'll make the change that we need. And so we are, um, we are more than happy to um, to come visit um, or to have a phone call or to do any of those things if, if that's something that would help you. We will continue to present the monthly state overall state rates so that you guys can watch those with us um, and you can see how the state's doing as a whole. Um, but I would really be interested in what what the hospitals, what the birthing facilities need, or what you're interested in. Would it be a disorder review, or we can cover unsats in depth? I mean, there's a whole multitude of things we could cover. So I'd really be interested, even if you take it back to your team and email us later, um, what you guys need and want from us so that we can do our, our best to help you. Well, Jennifer, I do not see any uh, further questions in the chat box. Um, again, if you all have recommendations for future webinar topics or if you have a question that even comes up, uh, feel free to send to us or to the newborn screening department. Um, you can get to OPQIC at info at opqic.org. And um, I also want to reiterate what Jennifer was saying about their visits to the hospital. Um, I've been able to attend one and it is extremely informative and really gets into your specific process to where you might be able to um, kind of pinpoint um, areas that would need to be improved um, to improve your own hospital's rates. So I would give a shout out for those. And I also want to remind everybody about the online training. Um, hopefully you've heard that several times from us, but it is, um, we believe, a good resource that includes a lot of information about 
the newborn metabolic screening process and includes videos on collection. So I think those videos are pretty valuable um, to help, especially those who are inexperienced, to see what um, the appropriate collection process looks like. So thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you.